I had the greatest job in the world, and that's working with dogs. Best in show winner is the French Bulldog. Winston won the National Dog Show. It was amazing, it was exciting. And to have a dog to be number one dog in this country, you have to have great nutrition. And I always fed Pro Plan, just like us. When we eat well, we feel good. And I just love that food and what it's done all these years to all the dogs I bred and all the dogs I've shown. Welcome to Pure Dog Talk. I am your host, Laura Reeves, and I'm pretty excited, you guys. We have a really, really special guest today. Amy Llewellyn Zadie is the project manager for the International Partnership for Dogs, which I think is an organization a lot of you may not have heard of. So there's a lot of great information that Amy is going to bring us. And we're also going to talk about inbreeding and genetic diversity, how those things go together, and what you can do when there isn't a test for a health um, problem within your breed. So things like cancer and seizures and all of these things bloat that are hugely impactful to our breeds, but there's no way to test for them. And so MA works on this type of research. And so I am giddy excited to have somebody with your credentials. Welcome, Amy. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here and talking to dog breeders. It's a wonderful opportunity to share some of our information. Yeah. As you mentioned, I'm from the International Partnership for Dogs. And previously, I worked for the Kennel Club in the UK. So a lot of my focus has been kind of abroad or on continental Europe. That's kind of where my background comes from. But um, I moved back to the United States a few years ago when I started working for IPFD. And now we're really trying to reach out to our North American um, friends as well. And right. uh, with our new CEO, we've got a Canadian at the helm and a second Canadian at the helm. So we're really hopeful that there will be um, more interest from North America to just find these kind of free resources that we yeah. have available for dog breeders and for vets um, to kind of give you some unbiased, transparent guidance. I love, um, it. I love it. So talk to us, give us your 411, a little bit about yourself, and ah. just kind of a brief overview of what you guys are doing at the International Partnership for Dogs, and then we'll kind of dive into some of our topic. Sure. So I am a third generation Pembroke Welsh Corgi owner. <laughs> My grandparents had uh, beef cattle in um, Oregon in the 1960s. They started their farm uh, up in Silverton, Oregon, and um, we got uh, my grandmother was a little bit of an Anglophile, and so she got um, two corgis back in the 70s um, in Oregon, which was, well, there weren't too many corgis out here then. And she had these great aspirations of having them being working corgis, and they worked really hard at cuddling. <laughs> And they maybe, you know, barked at things, but yeah, they were, they were, they started as working dogs, but were 100% lap professional, professional lap dogs, you know, that as, as corgis really know how to do it. And uh, I just never lost my love um, for, for the PEMS. And I think probably a slight bias generally towards herding breeds. I like, I like the smarts. I like the quirky little personalities. I like the challenge sometimes, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> So that's my dog background, um, but now I have the pleasure of providing support for my dog show friends. Uh, I don't actually show. I feel like it's a good for me with my line of work to kind of stay a little bit neutral and to stay a little bit unbiased. So I am the gal who's having the puppies when people need to go on vacation or go and do a show or when they need someone to support them in some other way. I provide that kind of um, background background crew, I guess, for for the, for the dog shows <laughs> bring the coffee i bring the coffee yeah. in the morning <laughs> everybody needs a pit crew man <laughs> uh, so that's kind of my dogs and dogs showing side and then my education background i started in genomics which is a study about how genetics kind of works actually in the plant sciences in uh 2000 and uh, and then I moved into uh, the canine species in 2012 when I started working as a health manager for the Kennel Club in the UK. And by the end of my time in the UK, I had developed um, a team and I was the head of health and research there, really focused on bringing uh, evidence-based education resources to 
breeders and to veterinary community and to breed advisors with lots and lots of tools and resources available. I really wanted to take the science and kind of translate it into something practical. There wasn't a lot of in between at the time between researchers and the people who actually have to make the breeding decisions. And that disconnect really bugged me, I think. It really bugged me that there wasn't such an easy way for communication between really the art and the science of dog breeding, trying to bring those things a little bit closer together. So that's what I did at the UK Kennel Club. And that's a lot of what I'm trying to do now with IPFD is take some of the mystery out of some of uh, science or some of the resources that are available, try to be really honest and transparent, what we know, what we don't know, what's still kind of out there, what things might be a bit, you know, maybe not the, the most ideal resources, I feel like that honesty is the best way for people to be informed and to make ultimately the breeding decisions. You guys have the hard job. You have the job of deciding, right? So I just want to give you information that can help you hopefully make those really informed decisions. I love it. I love it. Okay. So let's dive into one that's always and forever a topic, particularly Mm -hmm. a lot of my audience are breeders, whether they're sure. long time or first time or just trying to be, right? Mm-hmm. And so talking about inbreeding, which is important for keeping up your type and, and you know, mm-hmm. it's a breed, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Genetic diversity that helps us keep our dogs healthy. So talk to me about that. That's just such a tipping point balance. Yeah. Point. So inbreeding and genetic diversity are essentially two sides of the same coin. And I think actually, if we start talking about the definition really of what we mean by genetic diversity, I think a lot of people, including kind of, you know, experts, you say the word genetic diversity, but it maybe doesn't really have any meaning. We just kind of vaguely know it's good or something we should know about. But really all it refers to is how much kind of unique genetic variation, unique genetic differences um, there are within a species, whether it's humans or dogs or bats or whatever you're interested in. And the more unique genetic variation you have in a species, the more genetically diverse you are. So kind of the, that's the concept of it. So if you are being selective, if you're selecting as part of breeding, whether you're selecting your dogs to breed from or you're selecting your partner to have children with, if you have children, you are making a selection and that selection naturally narrows down all of the other potential breeding options you you may have had, right? And that selection is how we get, of course, all of the variety and the different types and the breeds that we have today. So we didn't always have um, breeds as we think of them now, and we didn't always have breeding processes like we have now. It's actually relatively recent within the last, you know, 150, 200 years that we started closing down stud books, which creates then a unique population, like a specific closed population. And when you close a population, that means that's all the genetic diversity, essentially, that you have within that population. Now, occasionally you get a little random mutation that happens, you know, things, things can, but really um, you're closing down all of your, or you're limiting what you can select from when you close a stud book. And that's how we retain type and that's how we breed true. And that's how we have the, you know, the, um, the selection choices that we have kind of today down the road. So genetic diversity is important to keep in mind. And I, I really want you to think about it as being in a breed as a whole concept rather than your own personal breeding choices. But genetic diversity across a breed is important because it's a massive insurance policy for your breed's future. This is how we're able to have options to breed away from any challenges that may come down the road. 
In fact, the reason why we have any inherited diseases in dogs is because we haven't historically over time and accumulates over time. We haven't been the best at planning our breeding, maybe because we didn't know any better or maybe because we'd had different priorities. We haven't been the best at managing genetic diversity and the development of some of our breeds. And so that's why we have inherited diseases because you're duplicating over and over and over again um, some genes that are maybe not desirable. The other side of genetic diversity. Oh, you have a question. No, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna pop in here really quick. I may. So I think it's really important that we that at that particular juncture that we're talking about this mm -hmm. genetic duplication represent mm -hmm. had to be there in the first place, right? And, yeah. And and since so many of these breeds were sort of founded and closed 200 years ago, right? Mm -hmm didn't have a way to know that that was there, right? So sure. Can you spin that out just a little bit for me? Yeah, absolutely. So when we um, started to close down those stud books mm -hmm. and um, have those more defined selection criteria, making uh, our breed standards mm -hmm. um, and kind of describing what the optimal kind of dog is and, and the thing that we all maybe should be aiming for. When those decisions started happening and when those choices started being made and then showing as a sport rather than so much breeding for function kind of became into the fashion, um, we only could make decisions on what we kind of could see. We could only really judge a, jo a dog's value or a do dog's health risk on what we could visually assess. So the phenotype is, is the technical term we use for that. Some of you may be familiar with that. Yep. Um, there was some knowledge. This coincided with generally an interest in a lot of Western countries about breeding, like cattle breeding and horse breeding and all of that. So people did have some ideas of inheritance, um, even if they didn't know the technical mechanisms for that. So, you know, I, I'm very sure that many dog breeders, if they had a few litters that were a bit, or like something strange was happening, or there was a dog that couldn't see or whatever, that they would select away from that, even if it had other good attributes. So we're, good. we weren't stupid 200 years ago. Right. <laughs> we, we just had, I hope that was okay to say. <laughs> we just had limited... <laughs> We just had limited information yep. Yep. compared to what we have available today. Exactly. Um, so, so we always really made the best decisions we could, um, and we had some idea. So the way that um, breeding, even without genetic tests, what we did before we had genetic tests is a lot of people did test matings to see what would happen, maybe because they wanted to avoid something undesirable, but more often than not, a test mating was to see if they could get something that they want, you know, to have a quality stick or a, right. a quality breed on that they that was desirable to them, to whoever was making that decision. So we weren't silly and we weren't working with no information, but we were very limited to what we could observe. And, and in some cases, we still are limited to what we can observe and, we're gonna get um, <laughs> and we'll get to that down the road yeah so that's kind of where we are with how we made decisions in the past and um maybe why the decision was made in most countries to kind of close those stud books is we're really trying to have very specific breeds with specific characteristics and physical attributes and we're making those decisions based on what we can see that what we can assess kind of visually um, and that's kind of where the genetic diversity started to be limited i think as popular um and i'm not saying these were these were wrong at all but uh, or i'm quite you know somewhat neutral as people became dog owners as well as dog breeders and we had a lot of encouragement from veterinary communities to neuter, um, which is very understandable because not every dog owner is going to be super responsible. But before neutering, let's just say things could, things could, <laughs> dogs may, 
dogs may choose their own genetic diversity now and then. And so there was maybe a little more I opportunity to, to kind of... happens. <laughs> yeah, of course, yes. We all have those uh-ohs. <laughs> I could... I could tell you some stories, but mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, some of those things would happen as well. And, and they're, they're maybe kept more in the pool, let's say, of possibilities mm -hmm. than, than perhaps we have today, where generally speaking, we're able to have, generally speaking, we're able to have much more control, at least within certainly the pedigree um, breeding population. So before I go too far away from genetic diversity. The other side, and again, I want to keep emphasizing this is breed wide thoughts. The other reason why genetic diversity is important to keep in mind as a population is that low genetic diversity can lead to something called inbreeding depression, which people may or may not have heard of. And that leads to smaller litter sizes, eventually infertility, and generally impacts the robustness or the longevity of a breed as a whole. And if you're reaching a point in a breed where you have inbreeding depression, then you're probably going to have to make some really dramatic changes as a breed in order for that breed to kind of continue. And, um, and sometimes that happens there's there's countries with really unique small populations that have developed really cool and interesting programs to like revitalize and re replenish and refresh their breed well i can i mean speaking to this very very specifically my parents started in clumber spaniels in the mm -hmm. like late 70s early 80s clumbers are a breed that were rebuilt from six individual animals after world war ii blah 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 yeah when we started in clumbers the 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 inbreeding depression was real you couldn't mm -hmm. get spread you couldn't you couldn't you know there was a lot of struggle with the breed and they were having a hard time and some of the key leaders of the breed at the time in the in the early 80s found a way to import dogs like from sweden and from other places that had their own still purebred but their own mm -hmm. small island that mm -hmm. would outcross right to what we had mm -hmm. here and bringing that genetic diversity has redounded to the health of the breed tremendously yeah yeah that's a really good example and um i'm delighted to say not necessarily unique there's other breeds that have had that that positive experiences as well mm -hmm. so that's kind of where we are with genetic diversity you know why it's important and why we have to think about it and and really, to me, it's about population level management. So that doesn't necessarily help you if you're an individual breeder in, the, in how you might want to think about your own breeding plans. So for an individual breeder or for a group of breeder friends, uh, I like to actually think about the term instead the other side of the coin of inbreeding because inbreeding can be more impactful for your own individual choices and that's where you kind of have more control um and so sometimes it's easier to think about it in your own breeding plans about every decision that you're making trying to reduce or slow the rate like how quickly inbreeding is occurring within your breed plans and therefore within your breed as a whole so inbreeding to me just feels like a bit of an easier term to kind of hold in my head when i'm trying to make a breeding decision or try to think about it and to kind of give you some confidence about what your plan is and your your hope is to try to select all of the traits that are important to you and to select on good health information using genetic tests and things that we can talk about later, but also try to ensure that you are, are bearing in mind kind of like a chess move, not just what you're breeding this generation or this litter, but where you're going to maybe go in subsequent litters. And so what I'm going to say now is the only time you will ever hear me say 
sometimes it's a stud dog's fault. I will never say it's a stud dog's fault ever, 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 ever again in any other circumstances. Well, and we have, and where it... <laughs> we have talked on this program. Um, yeah. Bell has been on. We've talked about popular sire. I mean, popular sire popular is sire. absolutely it... real, serious, significant issue in purebred dogs in my yeah. opinion. So it is the number one cause, way blasting everything else out of the water that impacts genetic diversity and more importantly, inbreeding. Because popular sire, it's not just that one stud dog, it's his father, it's his siblings, it may even be his brothers or his sisters, but it's the boys that contribute the most, right? We, we breed our bitches depending on what country you're in, two litters, four litters, that sort of thing. Something less than eight litters, let's say, at the absolute yeah. most, wherever you are in the world. And probably not that many, to be honest. But a stud dog, I mean, every weekend he could be mm -hmm. doing something for several years, right? Yeah. And you can freeze him and you can do whatever, right? So there's lots of options for um, that over contribution from an individual stud dog. And I'm going to keep saying that is the only time I will blame no, the stud dog for health because I know I, I don't know <laughs> saying that. And I don't think most people out there do. I do. Believe, so talk to me a little bit about this because this this is something that I think is interesting. You you went you mentioned it's not just the one stud dog; it's the extended family. So my solution yeah. has been rather than breed one individual stud dog to everything that walks, I want his brothers bred to it. And I want his sister yeah. spread so that the genetics is there that I can work with, but it's not the same exact animal. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the there will be some genetic variation between father and son and siblings and progeny. So the puppies, but it certainly won't be very much. That's kind of the point, right? You're, you've said yourself, you're wanting to retain those characteristics. So it is the big challenge about trying to breed for type, but not breed for necessarily relatedness. But relatedness makes it a little easier to breed for type. That's the kind of vicious cycle. So the there will be a little bit of variation between, you know, those close relatives, but honestly, not very much. And the reason that is the case is something called identical by descent, or in kind of more easy terms, having ancestors in common. Mm -hmm. So everyone and everything has, we're all inbred to a certain degree we kind of have to be because 25 generations ago in the 1300s humans would have had to have 34 million unique unrelated ancestors in order for us to not be inbred so we know like everything has we didn't have that many people on the planet then so we, we know there's got to be some some inbreeding um but it's having those common ancestors that leads to the risk and the best information we have at the moment in research is that the closer the um, ancestors are to you, like five to six, maybe up to 10 generations, the more impact they likely have on the genes that are going to be um, activated within your, your dog, whether that's good genes, the ones that you want, or whether it's something undesirable. And most of the time, you know, we all have these undesirable genetic variations, but most of the time they work fine because we've inherited a working copy, you know, from the dam or from the sire. So it doesn't really matter, but where we're having multiple duplications over and over and over again is where we get those, those difficulties. And we don't always know when we are selecting for that great tail set or that fantastic behavior that we might be pulling along with that. Yes, this aren't what we want. <laughs> it's super interesting, super, super fascinating. Like I want this one thing. So I want field ability. I want this dog that yeah. runs in a certain way and hunts in a certain way. And I want this disposition and I want this shape. Right. Yeah. And are those things tied to 
some deleterious gene? Are they tied to some cancer yeah. gene? Are they tied to some, right? So this- They, cer they certainly could be. They, they certainly could be. So there are some breeds like in Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, there are, we don't know, so nobody panic, but there is some emerging research and some emerging information coming out that maybe some of the behaviors that we like in that breed and certainly the skull conformation in that breed is also probably genetically related to Chiari malformation syringomyelia and potentially even some of the tissue issues with the with the heart. So mm -hmm. we don't know how it works, but there is some suspicion that there could be some relatedness or there could be some linkage between the desirable traits and the undesirable traits. And so it's maybe the extremists when we're going to extremes that is making it more pronounced and, and less beneficial to the dog. And I won't talk about our brachycephalic friends, but you all can fill in the blanks with that, that there is some relatedness between some undesirable traits linked to what we find desirable as well for the breed. Mm -hmm. So that is a really big challenge. Now, going back to your great question about, you know, breeding from relatives to try to avoid that one stud dog. Again, it's the chess move mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I give you permission to use a, a, a popular, maybe not a popular sire, but you know, a dog that is of the moment or a dog's relatives that are of a moment, but don't use them every time and don't use them six times in a row. A very old fashioned breeding method of two out, two in, one out, yes. two in, one out, you know, that's kind of a good rule of thumb as long as that out is way out <laughs> or, right. or maybe, you know, find again, find that type and not necessarily that, that relatedness that, that we're kind of looking for so that you're not narrowing down your options in your own breeding plans for the future. And I think to speak a little bit about this, this is another topic of conversation I've had with a number of breeders and, and um, like I said, Dr. Bell's been on the idea of I'm breeding in my family over here. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm doing, and my family is not inbred, but you know, pretty tightly held in my family. And there's this other person over here that's doing the same thing in their family. And so mm -hmm. we have gated islands. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, if we just mishmash everything, we don't have any way to outcross. Yeah. So there are lots of um, crossbreeding options. <laughs> that doesn't mean you have to go out of your breed. There are these parallel genetic lines that if they met every now and then would be a really great idea. Yes. There. And that's the easy one because they're probably meeting your breed standard really nicely, yep. right? Yep. And there are other populations maybe further physically away from you. Our, if you're in America, our friendly neighbors to the north in Canada might have some little islands. If you're okay with the postal system, then there's, you know, sperm rods that can be shuttled around or make a date when you're showing abroad or whatever it happens to be. There's some physical island differences yep. that can happen yep. in some breeds um, a little bit further out, maybe from your specific breed standard, but like there's show lines and working lines That's that awesome. would be a really easy way to do an outcross mm -hmm. without it being miles away from your breed. That's mm -hmm. still the same breed <laughs> it's, well, and it's, you know so there's some great tools that are not yeah. like dramatic and hopefully yeah. not too scary yeah. um and the challenge is, is the collaboration between breeders and and really good communication and kind of taking a little risk and maybe having a couple litters where you don't have a show dog but you still have some really great dogs I'm, and I'm i really in that right now <laughs> <laughs> yes literally and, am in the building brock Peace. Yeah, yeah. And actually, there's really good, you know, speaking selfishly as the one that's the dog owner and that not the dog show person, like having good quality breeders to send potential dog owners to is like there is not enough good quality dogs out there for people who want them. There just aren't enough. 
And I understand because maybe the breeder's motivation is different. You know, you're not just a machine producing, right? You have your own interests. But let's say we love those leftovers. We want them. You know, we want. <laughs> we will very happily take those gor to us perfect right. gorgeous wonderful right. well-reared thoughtfully bred dogs yep. we all want those we we don't want to have to you know deal with second best um that maybe they aren't what you want to show but are otherwise like to anyone else are right. probably 90 to 95 percent of the way there anyways and, right and you know i think that breeders and i kind of found, have found myself in this position you go and you do 25 or 30 years and you've built this and then you're like, okay, I'm here. Now what am I gonna do? Now I have to go start this all over again, right? And you go through that process. True Panion is revolutionizing medical insurance for pets by providing the best possible experience to our members. And it's not some space age dream, it's happening now. We pay your veterinarian directly while you're checking out and we're the only ones who can, which means you have decisions in seconds and you don't have to wait for reimbursement. So unlike with other providers, you'll keep more money in your pocket. Ask your veterinarian if Trupanion can pay them directly because there's pet insurance and then there's Trupanion. Okay, so Amy, we were talking about sort of the islands of, of breeding and, and ways that you can breed within your breed, whether it's to to uh, go to field lines or to go to Europe or, you know, whatever it is. Talk mm -hmm. to us uh, now a little bit about how we're going to incorporate that. So I myself am, am working with one of my protégés in a program to build back. Like I had reached this point. Now mm -hmm. I need to go here and kind of start this over again. And we've done a couple outcrosses intentionally with the goal of saying, okay, we, we're going to go out and now we're good we're good we can read in this closed environment again right and and have that diversity within our within our own program so talk to us a little bit about where the research is on that yeah so all of this really comes down to and i'm going to be a little bit philosophical all of this really comes down to how risky do you feel so we can we can rebuild any breed from scratch mm -hmm. if we needed to it would just take a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of consideration so in some ways being very radical and i'm setting health and welfare aside for just a second being very radical it's kind of up to a breed to make a choice do you want to keep breeding to your breed standard until you reach a point of um too much poor health and inbreeding depression and then you start again mm -hmm. or do you want to try to conserve and maintain kind of where you are now mm -hmm. or do you want to try to improve or expand your genetic diversity from where you are now and all three of those kind of philosophies are acceptable assuming you're keeping at least welfare in mind mm -hmm. and all three of those philosophies probably will fit all the different kinds of breeds in their unique situations mm -hmm. for the individual breeder i really go back to your personal job and your personal breeding plans i believe are to prioritize your dog's health and welfare followed very closely by conserving that breed type or those breed qualities that are important to you, right? That's the point. That's a, the point in the pleasure nice. and the art side, right? So if you're keeping in the back of your mind those chess moves, whether it's I'm going to use this, this type for a couple of times because I really like that or I want to introduce that, and then I'm going to have a couple of litters where I go out and just kind of rebuild that diversity and then maybe go back to that yep. type I happen to like. Yep. That's how you kind of weave through the genetic variation that you have within your breed population. You probably can't do that forever unless you're very, very lucky as a breed, like you can't do that forever, but you can probably do that for quite a long time. One of the ways that would help you with that is not neutering your 
dogs immediately. So, and this is, I, I'm saying this with a full knowledge that this might be hard to implement. I'm going to be really honest that find your unicorn <laughs> dog owners mm -hmm. that are okay and capable to responsibly keep entire dogs, even just for one or two years old before you assess them. Sometimes you look at a puppy at seven, eight weeks, you think, eh, it's okay, you know, but then you, you're not sure. And then you see him again at one year or 18 months or two years. And you think, dag nab it. <laughs> I should. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or maybe, or maybe in the case, you know, I have, I have an entire, um, you know, I've had an entire dog before that he had, he was probably, you know, 80% there in terms of quality, but then he lived to 17 without any health problems. And you, when he was like 10 or 12, and he was still interested in the ladies, how valuable is that? As well as like, he was, he was still met the breed standard. He wouldn't have won any medals, but he wasn't like googly eyed or anything. You know, he was like, he's he still looked good I'm, i am googly eyed to my, to my so my my point is is that if you're able to have your absolute like um backup backup plan of maybe a few dogs that you keep entire just a little bit longer mm -hmm. and there is supportive research for that there is a lot of good research that um, it can be really helpful to keep dogs entire for a little bit longer than we have traditionally um, been neutering our animals as pet owners, I should say, primarily um, in terms of their own health and, yes. and improving their own health, both for males and females. So I fully acknowledge the practical challenges with that. Um, I fully recognize that that might not be easy, but it is certainly something that's just another tool in your toolbox and to kind of help with breeding choices. I think, I mean, we have across several breeder friends and breeds that I'm involved with, we are working really hard because the loss of good stud dogs is real, right? Every, and, I hear that a lot, a lot of breeds. Mm -hmm. And so we are pushing really hard, even if we're not going to keep the male ourselves, to keep mm -hmm. it intact until it's two. Let me do its health mm -hmm. test, right? Let me, let me, even if I don't finish it, I don't even really care. I just want yeah. the I want the swimmers. And so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah. collected it too after it's health testing. And if you want to neuter it after that, I really don't care because I've got mm -hmm. it, right. And so that has been a tool that a bunch of us have been using as well. I that's that's a great that's a great way to to look at it and it just again it's giving you that extra choice and those extra options, particularly in some breeds their qualities need a little cooking time, a little maturing. And then you realize actually that was a great dog mm -hmm. and it would be worth breeding from and it would maybe produce yeah. some good show dogs and or have some really desirable qualities, yeah. uh, especially in terms of temperament. And in some breeds where you have later onset um, diseases, particularly diseases that don't have a DNA test. So now we're transitioning. We're gonna... Yes. <laughs> yeah. But having those older yeah. dogs, older yeah. dogs available, or yeah. that you know that they lasted that much longer longevity, that's important. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of where it's good. So do you have any more questions about genetic diversity no, or like this? I'm going to take this and now we're going to, this is a perfect segue. Let's okay. segue over okay. to so so you don't have so the things that we think of as most commonly that we have no way to test for right other than mm -hmm. um anecdotal conversation right so sure. seizure, seizure disorders cancer bloat those are the three mm -hmm. in my world that are the most absolutely devastating maybe throw in allergies you know that kind okay. of okay yeah Yes. So what to do when there isn't a test? And that is the million dollar question, but we have some answers if that's helpful to you. When there isn't a test and you have a disease pop up that you were not expecting, or if you're in a breed where you kind of know that there's some breed relatedness, but you don't have any tests or schemes or 
any kind of resources to be able to try to assess them, that phenotype, those bits we can see, you know, mm -hmm. it's really important to get an actual diagnosis if possible. So really make sure that you have a real diagnosis for two reasons. The first reason is the condition may not be what you think it is. And it also may not be inherited, mm -hmm. right? So you want to know when possible what you're dealing with to have some clues about whether it's an inherited form or not an inherited form or an I don't know form. So those are your three. And you could have that third one. People don't actually know. There are cancers that are breed related. There are cancers that happen within those same breeds that are not inherited. And there are cancers within those same breeds that may or may not be inherited. And what steps you take depends on what that diagnosis is, right? I personally would not recommend using any individual dog that has a health condition because you don't know how pregnancy, if it happens to be the bitch, might make the situation worse. You don't necessarily know whether something's inherited or not. It just seems like way riskier than anyone probably should take. So, so that dog is probably a pet or something else at this point, right? But you're probably going to be thinking about its siblings or its parents mm -hmm. or its children. What do you do with those dogs? Do you want to breed from her sister? Do you want to breed from his brother or his father? Again, because it's not the stud dog's fault. <laughs> no, it is the combination. And I tell people it is fault. the combination. <laughs> I, just, I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> so um uh really quickly to really labor this point down monorchidism so mm -hmm. if you you know they've only got they've only got one ball or no balls or you know balls aren't working right so many times i breeders do the right thing they get the diagnosis and they stop using that dog with only one ball and maybe they're really evolved and they don't use his father either because they get it you also can't use his sister and his mother, right? Because the genes are coming from both sides, not just from, just because it affects only male genitalia mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you're not having to inherit those risky genes. And that's a multiple genes are involved in that. So again, it's just kind of one dog. So it's really important to get that diagnosis and try to determine whether it's inherited or whether you don't know if it's inherited or not, because that will inform your next steps, right? Some of the resources you can use to find that information, we have that on uh, the IPFD dogwellnet.com website. We have a lot of that information. Your breed club or your kennel clubs might have some information on that. And there are some other um, kind of peer reviewed journals if you're a researcher or a scientist that you can access for free as well. So if your dog has bad luck and something's happened, prioritizing, treating, managing, or curing if possible, probably don't want to breed from that specific dog. And then you have to ask yourself the questions. And the questions are, should these genes continue to improve the breed, to improve my breeding lines? How much risk is there to breed on? Can I reduce that risk? Is there a DNA test or another assessment? What does the family history really look like? Are there risk-free or low-risk lines I could incorporate so that if I have moderate risk, do I know someone who has really low risk that I can use for breeding? And to obviously communicate with any owners that may have progeny already from that mating to kind of let you know if something occurs down the line, trying to keep that communication. So you gave some great specific examples. Do you want me to talk about some of those um, specific I ones? Before I do that, I do want to go back to the monarchid example you used earlier, yeah. um, because I, I think I just want to clarify, you're not saying you can never breed any animal from anything that's related to something monarchid ever because that's not a life-threatening health problem you sure just, yeah you can't do it without risk. yeah so monorchidism oh, yeah. is <laughs> is an interesting example because this is something that accumulates over many many generations your risk 
let me let me rephrase that to be really specific your risk increases over multiple generations this is that ancestors in common problem mm -hmm. where it doesn't necessarily impact your ancestor directly 10 generations ago but the time you get to today it's it's present and so if it's a problem in your lines maybe you want to put in a little bit of effort to reduce those risks if it's a problem in your breed you probably want to put a lot of effort into reducing those risks so that you can still breed then you know that it's kind of a scale of risk so if i had a dog with one ball <laughs> and it was uh and and I and he had many other wonderful qualities. Um, I would just be seeking a bitch that had no history or low history or almost no known history of monarchism in her father or her brother or her progeny and maybe her cousins as well, right? However much information I can get. And I know information is kind of hard to gather. Yeah. And then I would be okay with that because it's not something that's going to, that's not going to, that's a, not a welfare concern right. in, in that right. sense. And so mine is, I just take that monarchid dog out, but I still yeah. use its brother, but pay attention. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Dog. And I think that's great. And if you're in a breed, you can do that. But if I'm breeding Chesky Terriers and there's six of them, <laughs> I might have to be a little bit of a... Oh, sorry. Can you tell that the, the dog Our bell podcast. has gone out? <laughs> Probably. A well, let's talk about break. some of the yeah. ones that actually are life threatening. Cancer, seizures, yeah. bloat, maybe even yeah. allergies. Like the, the top three to me um, sure. that, that kill our dogs, right? How do yeah. we make decisions in a breed where cancer and seizures, for example, are rampant and we're trying to do everything we can to improve the health and longevity and continue to produce this particularly wonderful breed what do we do okay so for both cancer and for epilepsy there are genetic tests available mm -hmm. so again get that diagnosis if your dog has cancer because there may be a genetic test that you can use on the rest of your breeding plans to kind of help reduce that risk. So for epilepsy, there are juvenile onset epilepsy tests. There is a generalized myoclonic with photosensitivity genetic tests. Those are both related to specific breeds. And there are a lot of researchers working on epilepsy that may be able to either um, you can contribute like a cheek swab to help with that research, or they may be having some trial genetic tests that you can kind of get involved in to kind of help with that. So double check that there isn't a... <laughs> Shh. Corgis, what can I say? <laughs> um, and same for cancers. So the epilepsy tests tend to be breed specific or breed related. Mm -hmm. um, but with cancers, there are two cancer tests that are available to all dog breeds or all dog types. There is something called a C-kit somatic mutation for mast cell tumors. All of this is on dogwellnut.com, so you can check it out. There's... <laughs> And there's also the BRAF mut mutation, so invasive transitional cell carcinoma. That's for all dogs as well. And for my dear beloved Bernese people, there's histiocytic malignancy that's available as a genetic test as well. So for some of these specific cancers and specific epilepsies, there are genetic tests available that you can use to help you maybe make some decisions or at least to eliminate what might else be going on right so you know if you're not quite sure what kind of a cancer it is the genetic test might help give you some information on so that i'm going to pick your brain specifically i don't know if you saw me just frantically writing notes the tcc <laughs> test you were just talking about the cancer mm -hmm. uh, transitional cell i just lost a dog to that i've never even heard of it in our breed the breath mutation mm -hmm. okay so I'm going to test his siblings, his offspring, and what am I going to find? Am I going to find carrier, not carrier? Am I going to find affected, not affected? What am I going to find out? You're going to find a carrier or not carrier, affected or not affected. So you're going to find information that will help you select 
which dogs you want to use for breeding or which dogs you want to not maybe use for breeding or if you have it's going to cost me <laughs> yeah um so so that's that's the information you can make use to make specific kind of breeding decisions for that form of cancer at least to help you find the mating pairs that will help right. balance out and reduce that risk yeah. so so that genetic test may be particularly useful to you because you already have a little worry obviously um and and for other people as well and those that test is something that's all across breeds and i'm wanting to talk about all dogs are all across breeds because sometimes because cancer is so emotive as is epilepsy um we think it's something in our breed specifically or maybe our breed made really crappy decisions historically or we kind of self-flagellate or blame ourselves or you know do all are really harsh on ourselves and uh you know hold your i guess hold yourself accountable to a degree though you'd only know what you know but some cancers are just kind of part of dogs just being a, a dog or or sometimes they're part of being a type of a dog like some types of um dogs are more likely to be at risk than others whether it's size related or maybe they're an, a herding breed and it's just at some point when we ancient times started dividing out into generalized proto breeds let's say when we started having our wolfy looking ones and spitzy looking ones and we started having our molosser looking ones and we started having our retrieving looking ones before they were such distinctive breeds there would have already been selection causing inbreeding and increasing some genetic duplication right to get those desirable traits and you may bring some things along with that. So some of these cancers are not like specific, maybe necessarily to your breed, because your breed's bad. <laughs> they're, they're just specific well, to that type of dog. Sarcoma. Mangiosarcoma yeah. also has so many breeds. It's devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, in I know in some breeds, some of the breeds that I have been involved with, it's it's damn near endemic. And yeah. so it's it's really difficult, you know, to make yeah. breeding decisions like I can't make a breeding decision because I don't know of any dog in this country that hasn't had somebody somewhere lost a dog to hemangio like it's just not yeah so that's a really good I, a comment about some of the challenges and this is exactly what happens with um, those ancestors mm -hmm. that in common I what we call identical by descent so if you have cancer that is very common in your breed and a specific type of cancer that's common and there isn't a test but maybe you at least have a diagnosis mm -hmm. i go back to and this is just the best the best we can do for you try to find as unrelated as possible and i know that that may not be very easy the first step is try to find the dog that doesn't have their near relatives they don't they, aren't, they don't have the cancer themselves and neither does their mother and father or their siblings or any progeny that they've already had and hopefully not the cousins either if that's already too difficult in your breed like you just can't find a dog that doesn't have a near like one generation or two generation relative then you're starting to get into emergency territory and thinking about more radical options for your breed management as a whole and that's where you start talking about potential for outcrossing true outcrossings perhaps to another breed or or some other kind of um more radical considerations for breeding and i don't want you to be scared of that as an option or to feel like you failed your breed if you end up having to use a true outcross as an option because there are so many examples internationally especially about really successful outcrossing programs there's a plethora of them on dogwellnot.com as well but the nordic countries in particular have had great success in developing programs where they don't lose their type beyond one or maybe two generations and then they've got a whole refresh 
and of their genetic diversity and they have a lot more of a chance to reduce or eliminate some of these really nasty and pernicious conditions in their breed so don't be scared dalmatian, of that option the dalmatian pointer um yeah really particular that the u.s is pretty familiar with yeah, that's a great ex that's a great example. Shoot me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you know, for many breeds, not every breed, you don't have to go so very far out of your breed type. To, you're not necessarily having to breed a, a Chihuahua to a to a Great Dane right. to improve the great right. You can find something a little bit closer, or some someone that's a you know kind of within your breed general. Um, category, you know, to kind of make some improvements in that area. So just to encapsulate that again, if you're talking about epilepsy and cancer, get that diagnosis if you can, see if there's a genetic test available. Most of them will be um, single gene mutations, so you'll have more of a yes or no. Some of them might be a scale of risk, but they will all have breeding advice with those test results to kind of help you out to assess that risk. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any of those options, then really focus on avoiding those dogs that have close relatives that have had the condition. That's kind of your best option for right now. Okay. So do you want to talk about bloat? Yeah, <laughs> let's get bloat in here because again, we know it runs in families. I know there's been mm -hmm. bucket research on it. Um, mm -hmm. We know it runs in families anecdotally and by the research, yes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So bloat um, is, again, much like epilepsy and cancer, one of the number one research areas for a lot of canine researchers. Um, also, because it's not just in dogs, it's in a lot of valuable animals. Horses also suffer from bloat. And if you've got a multi-million dollar racehorse, you don't want it to get bloat. Right. Um, so bloat is something that you know, is in the livestock as well as the uh, companion animal universe of concern. Bloat is a real tricky one because there is certainly a genetic component. I don't think we can say that there's not um, under any circumstances. And the genetics are probably related to conformation. So the structure of the actual animal, whether it's a dog or whether it's a horse. And we know it's the barrel chest. We know that it's a certain kind of body type that tends to be um, more prone to bloat. The deep, narrow chest. Deep, narrow chest. Yes, deep, yeah. narrow chest. Yeah. yeah. Pardon me, I misspoke. Deep, narrow chest. We also know that there are environmental factors associated. And environmental factors in some breeds may be the larger component than the genetics and in other breeds there may not be there's not great research across all breeds about how much is genetic and how much might be environmental so it's a little, maybe a little more breed specific where the research is but genetics is somewhere between 30 and 70 percent depending on your breed and the rest is an environmental factor off the top of my head i think um the great danes is closer to the 70 percent but some of the more like retriever type breeds it, it's closer to the 30 percent but it there is some breed specificity there and then the environmental factors some of which you might have control over there's some some evidence about how you consume food can put you at higher risk or lower risk particularly um, after you've had an incident of bloat management tends to be about the environment and environmental factors rather than anything else so if your dog has had a bloat incident it should not be used for breeding and if it has close relatives probably that you know f1 kind of generation probably should not be used for breeding if possible simply because of that kind of high heritability that is involved with bloat, which I know is tricky in some breeds. It's, I know it's, tricky. it's very tricky. And I think, you know, for example, my experience in bloat is both in wire hair pointers and Akitas, right? So it's a higher incidence in Akitas. And I mean, I lost my own personal dog to it. Mm -hmm. after, after I saved him the first time and tacked him and he bloated again. So, mm -hmm. um, and in wire hair pointers where it's a much less common incidence, but it's there. Right, and you see it run through certain family lines. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think it's really fascinating that we're talking about the variability of the heritability, right? Mm -hmm. That I think is, is fascinating. And to me explains the difference between those two breeds. Yeah. And the reason probably why there is that variation has to do with the population size, uh, like how large numerically is that breed, because that impacts how many ancestors in common or how inbred that breed likely is. So there's something called, not to throw another term at you, called effective population size. And that is a universal standard of measurement talking about how many unique genetic individuals are in a population. Mm. So the giant panda, I think last count had about 60 out of 100 and 100 is like the optimal diversity in a species. Mm. Labradors had about 70 in the UK. So just to give you some idea, Chesky Terriers, I think had like 20 or 15. <laughs> Plus, plus their little fuzzy socks, right? So, um, and that has nothing to do with health. That has not, that's not a measure of, of health well, or welfare. It's just how much unique genetic variation but, there kind of is. And I think that that, to me, I love looking at that sort of concept. When you look at Akitas, you know, from Japan or the Clumber Spaniels that are a very, very old breed, right? Mm -hmm. The Squire Hair Pointers that are younger and was a much more diverse amalgam of dogs mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. that that in germany they didn't stop they didn't close their stud book in germany until the 60s yeah i i think that that speaks to me about part of why our our diversity is so good in our breed and the health is comparatively good in our breed yeah yeah i think um you know that just sings back to that in, inbreeding has an impact genetic diversity has an impact of the as, on the breed as a whole and this is why I, I don't want people to be afraid of any tool at their disposal is a valid tool some of the tools are your individual personal decisions mm -hmm. about how risky you feel mm -hmm. and some of them really are best managed on a on a more breed kind of level whether it's your breed club or your countries kind of national club however that management kind of occurs we made these dogs and these breeds we can make them again if we absolutely have to and sometimes we let them go there are many many dog breeds that are extinct and that we don't have anymore you gave a great example of the clumber that was work we worked so hard to carry on there's english water spaniels went out in the 1930s alpine mastiffs went out in the 1800s st john's water dogs went out in the 1980s mm -hmm. and the norfolk spaniel went out in around 1900 but they were a foundational animal in um the uh, uh, Welsh Springer Spaniels, I believe, or might be English Springer Spaniels, so don't quote me on that. So they kind of carry on in right. some ways, but as a unique breed, they, they no longer exist. And a lot of times it's because their purpose went away, you know, and, or something better was bred, something right. more, more specific to the purpose was bred. Right. I wonder in the future where our breeds will go for the desirability of how we live our current lifestyles, how long are we going to have some breeds that are a little trickier to live with for practical reasons, or maybe have lost their purpose, their kind of job that we, we had for them. Well, and we talk on this podcast a lot that purebred dogs as they exist in their form today are living history. You know, yeah. otter hounds, otter hounds are living history. And mm -hmm. why? of living history. I mean, it gives me goosebumps when I think about it. Yeah. Many of our breeds are. And so preserving them, preserving mm -hmm. those is, is really important and valuable, intrinsically valuable, just mm -hmm. like, and, and yeah. so how we do that and how we do that most successfully with the health and the well-being of the dogs involved, I think is paramount to the conversations that we have. So absolutely. And I have a real soft spot for otter hounds. They are my, if I was landed gentry breed, <laughs> I have a real, real right. soft. They're, 
they're cute. They're cute as a giant button for number one. Yes, um, but I also I also know why maybe they're not the best kind of modern day lifestyle dog because yep. they are oily and they're kind mm-hmm. of smelly and they're you know they're not mm-hmm. tiny and they're not but portable. I, and <laughs> you know, that as we talk about you know the repurposing, you know a lot of wire haired pointers, short haired pointers are being used as narcotics and and explosive detection dogs. Right. Mm-hmm. Otter hounds can be used for search and rescue. They don't have to hunt otters. Right. So, yeah. I mean, all of those kinds of things that as as society evolves, as our breeds continue to fit different niches while still carrying forward that that living history, I think, is yeah, is pretty important. So. In my one of my last projects at the Kennel Club in the UK was to kick off the conservation plans for breeds, and I really specifically named them conservation yeah. plans, yeah. not preservation. I'm not keeping them like in aspic. We're not just right. like, you know, keeping them as they are forever. But how can we conserve these breeds? And that's my personal philosophy. Is like I want to help you do what you want to do to a degree, right? I want, I want these breeds to continue because they're important to you and I'll give you the best advice and recommendations I can. I'm not going to make the decision about whether a breed should or shouldn't be, right? That's, that's not my job. My job is to support people who are asking questions and to try to give you the resources and the best advice or best information even um, that I can at the time, to, you know, keep these breeds going. So any final questions? No, this is amazing. I really appreciate it. And I am going to be reaching out to you more in the future because I know I will have more questions down the road. (laughs) If you have questions after this, we can do another in this subject area. If something occurs to you. Follow-ups and different topics. (laughs) I love having a new resource and you're practically my neighbor. So it's cool. Yes. Yes. Um, Speaking of neighbors, you were talking about purpose and repurposing just before we end. Do you know that in Oregon, we have these wonderful white truffles Mm -hmm. and corgi are being, I would say, additional purpose, because I think we still have some purpose left, additional purposing as truffle hunters, because they're little trotty toes, just dig, 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 dig. Can you imagine a herding breed is sniffing out truffles? Now there is a wild repurpose. Why not? I think there's so many, the the Legato Romagnolo used to be a duck hunting dog, and they turned into a truffle dog, right? So (laughs) repurposing isn't new. (laughs) Multi-purpose. Multi-purpose would be great. I love it. (laughs) Amy, thank Thank you so much for your time. I really thank you. Thank you. This has been an absolute pleasure. And I really hope we get a chance to do it again. I love talking with you and I love reaching out to new people. So thank you for inviting me and including me in this. (laughs) 